I would like to thank Tulsik for inviting me here. Uh, I have so far I have enjoyed your beautiful campus. I really liked it. And uh, so uh, I, you know, uh, this is a slightly different type of talk I did than I generally give. Uh, this is more of an introductory talk, and uh, I planned it to be more interactive, uh, you know, accessible to students. And um, so the title, as it goes, predicting the unpredictable, there itself it is kind of contradictory. You know, if you know that something is not predictable, how can you predict it? I will try to explain what I mean by unpredictable and uh, how Monte Carlo methods can do the job. Okay, um, so here is a brief uh, outline of my talk. Uh, I will mostly focus on different types of examples from different fields. Um, uh, so after preparing the talk, I came to know that you know uh, there are a lot of environmental and climate applications going around here. I don't have any uh, examples from there uh, in my slides, but I'll try to briefly touch on some of the examples where you know uh, if we will use Monte Carlo methods or Monte Carlo methods are used uh, for uh, environmental uh, applications. Uh, so I'll introduce with some again examples. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when I'm describing the methods very briefly, uh, you know, I'll talk about the ordinary or the classical Monte Carlo method. And then uh, uh, some uh, other methods, which are generalizations of those uh, classical tools, and namely uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, so, again, I will talk about why it is needed, why do we need that extension, why do we need these generalizations, again, from different examples. Uh, so then I'll focus on two specific examples, one from statistical mechanics, uh, and then one from uh, plant science, okay? Uh, um, and if I have time, I'll get into uh, a class of Monte Carlo methods known as important sampling, but I'm not sure whether I'll have time. Okay, and um, so uh, here you go. Uh, Monte Carlo methods use random sampling to predict possible outcomes of an uncertain event. Uh, a lot of buzzwords there: random sampling, and you know, uh, uh, uncertain event maybe not that uncertain. Uh, so we we you know we uh, we spend time on uh, you know, describing what we mean by random sampling, how it is used to predict things. We'll talk about that, and uh, you know. Uh, so then there are some more buzzwords like integrals, optimizations. So these are complex problems in science and uh, engineering. Integrals is basically you know uh, area the volume. Uh, of the things, and you know, uh, uh, again, uh, in, very soon, if you're trying to find integrals, evaluate integrals, very soon, uh, you know that you won't be able to find it in closed form. And uh, there, Monte Carlo methods can be used. Similarly, optimization uh, for you know, doing optimization, Monte Carlo methods can be used. Again, let's see uh, how far we can. Uh, uh, you know, go and talk about uh, different, you know, all these different applications. So here's a brief uh, history. Um, Monte Carlo methods uh, was first. Uh, uh, it was Ulam stands for Ulam who came up with this idea. Uh, you know, while he was thinking of cards, playing cards, and he thought of that idea that he might be able to use it to solve problems in science. That's how the name Monte Carlo also came. You know, the Monte Carlo is a casino in uh, Monaco, the beautiful city Monaco. Um, and then uh, Von Amon helped him uh, to formalize this. And uh, Metropolis, all these names, you know, they were all involved in that uh, Manhattan project. And that's where actually that was the birth uh, uh, place of Monte Carlo methods. And I will be talking about that example here also today. Uh, that led to the uh, development of Monte Carlo methods. And um, uh, so, okay, 
I will start with a simple problem that we students face. Even, you know, uh, working people also face the same kind of situation. So here is the problem. So at 9 a.m., uh, you get two new ass assignments from two different professors. And they are due at 5 p.m. on that day. You have already scheduled a meetup with friends at 3 p.m. Will you make it to the meeting on time? Again, will you make it to the meeting on time after successfully completing your assignments? That is the question. No, we are not predicting who you are going to meet. Might be that that might be predictable, but we are not predicting that. We are predicting your chance being able to meet after successfully completing the assignments. So that's the problem. You know, that for students, the, the assignments from the professors, for, you know, people who are working uh, from their boss, uh, you know, whoever, this is, a, this is the problem. Now, how do you go about it? Well, so, you know, for this, any problem like this, so we then start with making some assumptions. You know. To try to simplify problems. These are the times we solve problems. You know, we, try to make, you know, we try to make some assumptions. So, for example, we find out so what we are interested in. We are interested in that whether we are able to finish solving those assignments, completing those assignments before 3 p.m. So, it's basically in six hours. Right? Now, so the dependent variable, the, dip, the time we are interested in, is the time to finish the two assignments. And the, the thing that we are interested in is the sum of those two times, right? And we are interested to know whether that is less than six hours or not. That's the problem. So then, uh, we, so no, we know that our independent variable are those two times, those two times, the time to finish the assignments. We make assumptions. So generally in science, we make assumptions from our experiences, uh, you know, or other people's experiences that we have heard from them, or our own experience. So here is, so we have been, you know, we have been solving problems for these professors. So from past experience, we know that it takes one to three hours and two to five, five hours, respectively, to complete these two assignments. Okay? And one more assumption we are making here, that your performance on one has no bearing on the other. So, you know, how quickly you solve one of the homeworks has no, uh, you know, influence on how long it is going to take on the other. Now let's see. We have made some assumptions. Now, can we solve the problem? Okay. So I'm going to give you a Monte Carlo solution to this problem. So here I have, you know, I have a simple figure here. You can see X and Y here, the two variables here. X is the time it takes to uh, finish the first assignment. Y is the time it takes to finish the second assignment. The information, the assumption I made that X is generally taking a value between one to three, Y is taking a value between two to five. But, you know, I don't know exactly what is the value of X, so X is random, because, you know, sometimes, you know, some of these homeworks are very hard, some of them, you know, it takes around three hours, some of these homeworks are easy, one hour, right? So it takes a value between one to three. So without any other assumption, so what I mean to say, we are saying that it can, you know, it is equal, any value between one to three is equally likely, right? I, I cannot favor any region in on this interval over other. So this is what is known as that you are dividing the weight uniformly over, over the interval one to three, okay? Now I know that the total probability, the total chance is 100% one, right? Now if I divide it uniformly over one to three, this is what I get because, you know, the area under this line has to be one. So I know the rectangle's area. So the height has to be 0.5. Are you all with me? Right? So this is 
the distribution of x. This is the distribution of x. Similarly, that's the distribution of y. That is the distribution of y. So I'm equally dividing the terms, the, the, probability, the total probability one, on the interval two to five, which is of length three. So if I divide it, then the height has to be one third, right? One third. So this is x, this is y. Now what I am interested in? x plus y. And exactly what I'm interested in, x plus, whether x plus y is less than six or not. If x plus y is less than six, well, I'm happy, right? My professors are happy, my dates are happy, my social life is happy, like everything, right? Good end. So what is the probability that x plus y is less than five? That is what we want to know. Now, I know the probability with what probability x takes different values, with what probability y takes different values, what is the probability with which x plus y takes different values? Are you all okay with, with that? Now, one thing I know, that the least possible value of x plus y is 3, because the minimum value here is 1, minimum value here for y is 2, so 1 plus 2 is the minimum value for x plus y, which is 3. The maximum value is 3 plus 5, which is 8. So x plus y takes values between 3 to 8. That you all are okay with that, right? Question is, will that also be uniform between 3 and 8? Any take? Any help here? Do you think it will be uniform? No? Why not? Any intuition why it won't be uniform? So let's think it this way. Will x plus y taking values 3 be equally like your, you know, the chance is similar to taking values say near 5? Will it be similar or less or more? There are different combinations, different ways. So the thing is, for x plus y to take value near 3, both x has to be near 1 and y has to be near 2. But for x plus y to be near, say, 5, there are a lot of possibilities of x and y by which x plus y can be 5, right? So it won't be uniform. That intuitively is very clear, that it won't be uniform. So what I did is I used Monte Carlo methods to find out the distribution of x plus y. It's pretty easy. In whatever you know, language you know in for coding language, C, C++, Python, R. I am using here a something called R. How many of you have heard the statistical language called R? It's publicly available, right? So I use that language, uh, R, to make this plot. So what I did is this. I know that the distribution of x, I know the distribution of y, which is uniform, right? Both are uniform. I just, just made a bunch of draws from the uniform. This is called random sampling. It's basically this. See, I have the interval one to three, right? I have the interval one to three. Random sampling means this. So say, suppose, uh, you know, we are 100 people here. Each of one, each one of us comes to the board and pick a point between one and three. That is a random sample. And assuming that you are not biased to any values in the interval one to three, that's a uniform drop. That is a random sample. Okay. Now, you know, I don't have one million people here. I need, I mean, I'm just using a little more sample. You know, and then if I ask you to do that right now, I will be able to finish the talk. So that's why I use the computer and I use this one line to give me 1 million draws from 1 to 3, you know, from that sample. Similarly, I do that for y, right? Now, each time I have a sample from x, I have a sample from y, and I add those two samples. That is a draw from the distribution of x plus y, right? So now I have 1 million draws from the distribution of x plus y. I plot that. That is that plot. And you can see this far I think, from uniform. Right? It's far away from it. So you, the more they're in the middle, right? The probability is getting down as you're going to the extreme, right? And from this, I can easily find out what, like, you know, out of this 1 million draws of x plus y, how many times 
it is less than six. And here I did the compliment. How many times it is less than uh, above six? So it is around 33%. So around 67% chance that your professors will be happy and you will also have a good social life. Okay, so uh, just one thing. So now you can see what I mean by unpredictable. Mean a question where you might not be able to do a closed form solution, but you have simple Monte Carlo methods to solve it. By the way, in this case, you have a closed form solution. You can actually find out the distribution of X plus Y in closed form. You know, if you come to my office after the talk, I will tell you how to do that. But it is you know, easy only because I'm making that big assumption here, which I you know kind of rust that uh, uh, this that your performance on one has no bearing on the other, which we call independence assumption. If you don't make that independence assumption, then finding that closed form solution of for the distribution of x plus y is also be very difficult. Okay, so anyway, uh, so complex problem, you have a simple Monte Carlo solution, approximate solution, but very, you know, uh, you know, very simple, very simple, just three lines of code. That's it, three lines of code. Any question? Yes. I'm your standard case in physics. Uh, how do we choose N? Very good. Very good question. I'll come back to your question. And thanks, thanks for asking the question. So he's asking, why one million? Why not just one hundred? Or why not one ten million? I'll come back to your question. I'll come back. Any other question? Okay. So also good. Okay. So this approach that we took here is applicable to many, many, many areas. I'll give you some examples here. So basically, this is the situation. Consider situations where you have dependent variables of interest, which can be connected to appropriate independent variables through some equations, which often we often call models. And you can think of many situations, many, many examples, your academic performance. They are dependent on many things, right? How much time you are spending at the pub or whatever, right? You know, how much time you are spending in the library, right? Uh, the climate depends on several things, you know, different environmental variables, right? So, in many such situations, we can use Monte Carlo methods. And that the way we bought it, like we just do. It. Okay, I'll give you some examples. So, you know, this example might not be really interesting to many of the young people. So the invest, investment portfolio a person would need to support their desired retirement lifestyle and financial goals after retirement. Now you think about this. It, it is dependent on so many things, right? The tax, you know, how it changes over the years. The, the, the different uh, stocks, how it performs over the year. In fact, Right now, my portfolio, the weights, like the depends on the performance of the last month, yesterday, right? Now you want to predict for someone who just joined, you know, the workforce in his retirement, 30 years down the lane, right? So again, here you have a dependent variable of your interest, which is a function of so many different independent variables. And if you can connect it appropriately through equations, you can use Monte Carlo methods to you know, predict the whole path, even the whole path, how it is going to move from year to year, from you know, season to season to the you know to your return. Obviously, you know, the longer you make the prediction, it will be worse, but you can do this. You can do this, whereas a closed form solution is next to impossible. Um, it is another example. You know, wherever, whenever a product is manufactured, right, you want to uh, predict its, uh, you know, reliability. For human, we call it survival. <laughs> Of the probability of survival for 
manifesting components we call it reliability. And in fact, it is dependent on many things. Like, you know, you want to, like, you know, some products come with five years warranty, some products come with one year warranty, right? And this all depend on that. Just like us, the life insurance premiums, right? Now, think about this. Here, this is a fan. Suppose you are using the fan. This is in the seminar room. It's not used, maybe they're not that much, you know, whenever the speaker comes and stuff like that. But in an office, the same fan is under constant use. In the body code, it is even using, being used more. So it is under different working conditions. You want to predict the reliability of this, the same product. This is dependent on so many things. Monte Carlo methods you can use and these use uh, to predict the reliability. And that is how we actually is determined. You know, there are famous uh, true events happened with big companies, even GE, Boeing, how they ran into problems uh, by not predicting this well. Uh, you can Google it and find out. Um, let's see. So, um, Later, I will give you two concrete examples, one from statistical mechanics, from physics, and one from uh, plant science, okay? Uh, where, uh, you know, I'll give you the distributions and how multiple methods is used. Okay, so one slide for the methods. You know, how, 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 how is it done? How is it done? How is it done? A key observation. So suppose, you know, uh, you have a die and you believe it's a fair die. I mean, that means it's not biased to any of the six values. And you roll the, the, that fair die as randomly as you could. If you roll it six times, are you going to get all the six values? No. Is it fair? Is it a fair test? You didn't get six different values on the six throws. So only when if you keep rolling the dice many, many times, many, many times, then you will see in the long run, the proportion of times you get all the six values is hovering around one sixth. That's why you call it a fair time. This is a key observation. So everything in the, when you're doing, so basically whenever you were Rolling a die, you are getting a random sample. So you believe it's a fair die. So that means the distribution is one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, right? You roll the die, you observe the, the phase value, which turns out that is an observation. That is a random sample. That's a random sample. So we are now from this simple random like dice throwing, we have observed that you know in the short run we cannot you know uh, use it to predict things. You know, it doesn't go near the truth. Only in the long run. So might be there's a law of long run, a law of large numbers. Might be, might be. And there's no law of short numbers of two or so, short run. And this is very important. Many people go to casino, but, you know, believing, believing that they have, there's a law of short run. You know, you invest money, I lose. They gain with the money, lose. I said, okay, I lost twice. Maybe third time we will lose. We. In this moment, go back down because there is no law of short limits. Okay, only in the long run things convert. This is a key observation, and that is the crux of the idea for the Monte Carlo method, which I'm going to tell you now. So uh, again, this little uh, complicated. I have an equation here. Uh, so here's a notation here. So let's not worry about this first. Let's worry about this. So here pi. The notation pi, the Greek letter pi I'm using, is a distribution. Just like you know the uniform distribution I showed you on the first slide, or the you know just the dice throw, the one six one six one, right? So that's a distribution. Here's a pi is a distribution, and it's a distribution on some space s, on some space s, some space s. And here's a function h, which I'm interested in. And in particular, I'm interested in what is called the mean of the function, which mean is basically a weighted sum, the where, where it's being the probabilities. Okay, so that is what I'm interested in. That's what I'm interested in. And that's in fact that probability on the first slide, the probability that p is less than six, that is indeed a can be written as as, as as this mean. Okay, for for an accurate function. Okay, that's it. 
Now, the thing is, so that's why I'm using the notation E for expectation of the function H with respect to the distribution pi. So that's why pi is the substitute. So what's your That's the notation. Okay. Obviously, if I could do it in closed form by taking a paper and a pencil or pen, ah, done. You don't invite me here, right? I wouldn't have a job if you could do it in closed form. The nice thing is, for most of the problems in practice, this cannot be done in closed form. That's why, you know, they're, they're giving me a job. That we cannot do it in closed form, that may be due to different reasons. Some of the examples that I'll show you to the concrete examples from physics and biology, this ACE is too large, too large. Even the supercomputing, uh, the, the best, the supercomputer that we have, fails much, much, much before for the problem that we need to do. So we cannot do it in closed form, okay? So I'll give you some examples. Just trust me for, you know, for a couple of minutes, okay? That this is interesting, that we cannot do it in closed form, okay? I am giving you a Monte Carlo solution. And what is the Monte Carlo solution? Monte Carlo method says, well, all you need to do, just get some samples from pi. That's what I did in my, you know, in my assignment problem. We just get a bunch of sample, a sample of size n. I, I know, I, you know, that burning question, how, how we decide n, we'll talk about that. So get a sample of size n, just simply calculate the sample mean. There's the, again, the weighted average, the weighted average being the weight, being the empirical weight, the one over n, okay? So it's the sum it and divide by the number of samples. That's the sample mean. These people call the population mean. That's, the, that's what I'm interested in. This is I can get, this I can get from the samples. I was talking about the law of large number. Indeed, there is a law of large number, which says, this sample mean is close to the population mean if n is large. Okay, so all this I have written it for that. The sample mean is close to the population mean when n is large. n is large. Again, how do you mean large? Again, right? What do you mean n is large? Well, larger the better. So if I have an idea about how much error I am making, see, this is my target. This is my target. This is, sorry. This is my target. This is my target. This is my approximation. So the error I am making is the difference. If I have an idea about how much error I am making based on a sample of size n, then I'll tell you, I'll be able to tell you like, you know, how large n is needed. You know, there's a problem here. You were asked, you know, we are asked to find out the error, but I do not know the truth. If I knew the truth, I would do it in the approximation. Isn't it? If I knew the truth, I would do the approximation. And if I don't know the truth, how will I find the error? Well, you know, there are smart people who studied this problem. Okay, there's smart people, smart people. They found out well, even without knowing the truth, they found out that you know the error that we are making is of the order of what is called one over square root n. Okay, so the error is of the order square root n. So as you can see, as e as n increases, square root n increases, one over square root n will decrease, right? So that means so now suppose you know that I want this much of error. 0 0.01 error. I'll tell you how large your sample set need to be. You tell me the error, I'll tell you how much sample do you need, how many samples you need. That's the beauty of this result. It's a fundamental result in statistics. Some people have uh, actually call this result the fundamentals, you know, like just like fundamental result of arithmetic, fundamental theorem of algebra. This some people call this the fundamental theorem of statistics. Is so fundamental. In particular, so here, here is what is you know we call the interval, confidence interval. So indeed, you can find out the confidence interval, like from this, you know, the mean, that's your approximation, and the sample standard deviation. You can find out an interval in which the truth, the truth lies with very high probability, very high probability. 
And in fact, the width of this interval, you know. So, you know, again, depending on the context, if you're, you know, thinking about the safety of a nuclear system, right, there you need to be very precise, right? Right? A small error can have, you know, devastating consequences. On the other end, if it's uh, that probability of, you know, whether I'll be able to make it to my, uh, the meeting tour with my friends, you might not be interested in having that much, you know, you don't need to be that precise. So you don't need that many samples. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, yes. Is the probability of each each occurring, right? So pi of x is the probability of observing x. But here we're calculating the expected value of h. Expected value of the function h. Right. So, but then it should be multiplied. Pi should be a function of h. Then, no. Each h observation has a pi value. And each so observation has a pi value. Yes, you are right. Each, That's the way. Right. Uh -huh. So then the pi it should be pi h inside, not x. H is oh. a function of x. H is a function. So here's the thing. This, uh, so, okay, so then it's, no. just a, it's just a function of h and therefore the exactly okay. exactly so, okay. so in that example right. if you will, like in that example h is yeah. an indicator function okay, okay. so that's uh, okay. that, yeah that's it. Okay. good um so i'll give you an it so how much time is that okay okay we're good we're good so i'll give you some concrete examples and i as i promised you the i'll give you the first example where the monte carlo methods people thought that is needed you know without that they could not do it and in fact, they were building the first atom bomb. You know, it was important uh, as a job. So they could build the bomb without having the Monte Carlo method. That's exactly how it came. Happy or, you know, whether you'll be happy or sad about it, I don't know. But yeah, that's the, that's the thing. So here is um, what is known as the Boltzmann distribution. So uh, let's see. So this is, um, you know, so, you know, this is the system. Uh, there's a system, you know, particles there. Uh, this, so the, the systems of I'm in, you, you, using this notation to denote the state, and every state has some energy, which I'm denoting by E for energy. And the Boltzmann distribution is basically giving you the dis distribution of different states of the particles, right? Right. And that distribution, this is known as the Boltzmann distribution, which is given by this uh, function here, E, the exponential function, the exponential function E to the power minus E m, the energy of of the system at that state divided by you know k k is you know the Boltzmann constant which is you know one of the constants which you know at the value and t is the temperature the temperature of the system at the time okay and this is what is z well okay so let me I think I have it here so z so okay so this is a probability distribution what is the probability distribution probability distribution is nothing but you have a non-negative function which sum to one that is the probability distribution that's the problem. You have non-negative function, which sums to one, which is the total probability. So here I'm giving you a non-negative function, it's the exponential, so it's non-negative. So all I need to make sure that it adds to one, then I will have a distribution. Now, how will it make it add to one? If I sum over the values, that if I sum over all states, that is the z, that will make it the distribution, right? Right, right. So this is this is z, which is you know, it's called the partition function, is itself a very important quantity. Because you know, the lot of things depends on z. Um, so like for example, the free energy of the system is minus kT log of z. So so the, the, the so so z itself, the partition function itself is very important. So you want to know, you want to know its value. Again, nothing is uh, complicated so far, right? You know, we can do it, right? You know, the only thing if this sum is huge. The number of possibility of the state is used, then I will be running into trouble. But is that the case? Let's see. Let's see. let's see. before that. So let's come uh, come to your uh, question about the, here's another example where that h and the function uh, you know the uh, the mean is coming. So for example, we are generally so for Boltzmann distribution, we are generally interested in averages like averages of functions like u. Okay. So for example, the average energy of a system is basically when I'm summing over, you know, over the Boltzmann distribution times E. So the function here H is H is E, H is E. But it can be other functions, it can be other functions, it can be other functions of the state, okay? So now you see, again, I'm 
I want to know, for example, the average energy, right, of, the, of any particular system, right, you know, I want to know average energy, right, you know, again, you can understand why they're interested, like when they're building the bomb, how much energy it will have, right, so they're interested, you can see now why they're interested to in this problem, right, and the problem they're interested in is involving two sums, it's a ratio of two sums, the, the, in the denominator, I have the, the, the partition function itself, that the normalizing constant of the Boltzmann distribution. In the denominator, I have the same sum, but now it's multiplied with a function. Again, all good if I could do the sum in close to, right? if I could be numerically evaluated, like, you know, maybe say, uh, you know, say 50 there, 50 of those I evaluate five today, tomorrow come to office another five, in 10 days I'll be done. Let's, let's see. Any questions? I'll give you a simple. Oh, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always by the same Consider the simple icing model. It's one of the simple models, simple model, where there are only two possible, two spin possible, the upward or downward spin. Suppose there are n spins, okay, n particles there. Every particle can either go up or down. That's the only two possibilities. In practice, it can be many, but suppose I think already is also used, it's simpler. Only two possibilities upward or downward, okay. There are n spins. So, how many possibilities are there? 2 to the power of n. 2 to the power n. So you can see with around only 70 particles, you reach Avogadro number. Only around 70 particles, you reach Avogadro number. The best supercomputer that we have, we can do this only up to say, for simple icing model, even with very good coding. So by the way, students, you can possibly see the beauty of the you need to know math. Remember I told you that fundamental math theorem of statistics. You need to know math to understand how much error you're making. You need to be able to do good computing also. So even with you know the supercomputer that we have, you cannot go beyond 30 particles. To deliver 30 is itself to be. You cannot do complete enumeration. You cannot do this sum. You cannot do, uh, you cannot find out the average energy. That's the problem they have. Okay? That is the problem they have. Because even with the simplicing model, this is the problem. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. Okay. Um, let me backtrack here. So I have a mod, like, you know, Monte Carlo solution. That is, if I could sample from this distribution, then I could do the Monte Carlo method, right? I could take the average of the energies, and that will be an approximation to this. Now the problem is you can see the distribution itself is not known. <laughs> because I don't know the normalizing constant. So they came up with this idea, but then they found out, okay, they cannot sample from it. They cannot get uh, sample. They cannot get sample, direct, direct samples from this distribution. So then they came up with what is known as a Markov chain Monte Carlo solution to this problem. Again, I'm repeating this line from my previous uh, slide. Um, that remember, I have a pi, a, a distribution pi on the space X, S, and I have function h, whose mean I want to, you know, approximate. You know, if I could do a close form uh, evaluation, then good, but I generally am not able to do it, like in my last example. By the way, one thing I want to uh, tell you, although I'm writing it as a sum, and my examples, a lot of examples are discrete space, s is discrete, but it doesn't have to, okay? It can be a continuous space, and if you're familiar with something that notation integral, this can be an integral, 
with the end you know, of this, we have to worry about what is the dominating measure and stuff like that. But all this, I me, mean, I'm just you know, simplifying things and writing here as a sum. But all these things that we are talking about are generally applicable. Okay, generally applicable to abstract spaces, to different spaces. Functions can leave, distributions can leave on you know different different spaces. And the same law of large number of in the order. Okay. So the ordinary Monte Carlo solution was, which we again discussed, you get some sample from the distribution and take the average. Yes. So even if the PDF is known, here is a PMF. Yes. PMF, yeah. Mm -hmm. Still something cannot be easy. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so the thing is that in my last example, the PMF was not completely known. It was known only up to knowledge in constant. That's why I said it was difficult. But there are situations where the PMF is completely known, but so you can get ID sample, but it can it may it you can always get ID sample, but uh, theoretically, but computationally it is infeasible in a sense that you have to wait months, years to get one sample. So okay. yes, that is uh, yes. What is IID? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, did I mention it? Some, oh, IID mean independent and identically distributed. So let me, uh, so uh, what, what does it mean? So one I is called identical. That means they're all sampled from pi, okay? And independent mean the samples do not depend on each other. They're simple, do not depend on each other. And that was the problem. They could not get identical sample. So what they went for, they went for dependent samples. And they, are, they went, so I'll, I'll just briefly talk about this. Um, so what they uh, did, so this was the paper, the 1953 paper, you know, which appeared in General Chemical Physics. Again, you can see all the big names, all the big names, all the big names, all the big names of all the, you know, the stalwarts physicists at the time. And um, so what, uh, when they realized that they cannot get ID sample, so they came up with this idea, which, you know, again, uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about it. So they, uh, if you're familiar with uh, what is known as a Markov chain, then uh, what they basically did, they said, well, I cannot get ID sample, but can I get a Markov chain whose stationary distribution is my target distribution pi? Okay. So then use those realizations of the Markov chain as my sample. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do. Now, what is a Markov chain? So it's basically, I'll give you one construction in the next slide. So it is basically, as I said, it's a dependent sequence of variables, okay? Which none of these is an exact sample of from pi, but if you keep running the samples, if you keep going and going, you know, keep getting the samples, in the long run, the distribution of the XN, a distribution of the samples converge to pi. So in the long run, you will get samples from pi. Okay, so this is the amount of check. Uh, and I'll give one construction in the next slide, how we construct it. And this is actually from their paper. The thing is, what they found out, remember the law of large number which helped us for the Monte Carlo method. That is why I could use the sample mean, because the law of large number says sample mean is close to the population mean if A is large. What they realize that holds even more generally. Even if you replace those IID samples, the independent and identically distributed sample, the exact samples with these approximate samples, the Markov chain samples, still that approximation hold. That is, still the sample mean is close to the population mean. Okay. So that was that is the uh, the idea behind the Markov chain Monte Carlo. Now I will um, give you okay. Uh, I have fifteen minutes. Sir. Okay, so I'll give you one construction of this Markov chain. It's a very general construction. So again, remember, pi is my target distribution from which I want to get sample, but I cannot get exact samples from it. So what I do, I get you know, uh, a dependent sample. So I start with somewhere, I start with somewhere, you know, at zero, for example, I start with somewhere. 
a value, any value on the state space. Then the next value that I, you know, it's a dependent sequence of dependent variables. So the next step will depend on my current value, right? In the next step, I make a draw from some distribution Q, which depend on XM, that is the current value, okay? And then I either decide to take that proposed value or not. Does I decide to move there or stay where I am? So you suppose I'm at X, I make a proposal Y from some distribution of Q, and it's very general. It's, you know, Q doesn't have to be anything related to pi. It's very general, very general, okay? Obviously, some will be better than other. <laughs> By changing Q, change the mark of chain. Some chain will be better than other chain. But in general, there is no restriction on Q, okay? So you propose a value from Q, and then you either decide to move there or stay back where you went, okay? Now, how you decide to move, that is depending on what is called this acceptance probability. So you calculate this ratio, okay? And then make a uniform draw, and or basically calculate this ratio and flip a coin with that probability. If it's a heads, you move to the value. If it's tails, you stay back. This is a Markov chain. It turns out this Markov chain, you know, which is very simple, as I said, right? It's very simple, right? If you start, if you keep doing this, in the long run, it actually, that target, you reach, a, you, you reach the target. The target is the stationary distribution for this chain. Okay, now uh, um, I'll tell you for the Boltzmann distribution how we can do it and how we did it. Again, uh, they start with some state, some state, right? Some basically, you know, for the icing model, they you know start they start with you know some particle which are downward, some particle which are upward. That's basically a state, right? That's basically a state. They start start somewhere. They start somewhere. Then they move, right? That's Q. Then you have many choices. What they did, they did a local move. So for example, like you have, so your current state is say 50, but these 50 persons are downward, these 50 persons are upward, right? That's your current state. So you propose, so for example, one of these upward move, you change it to downward. Okay? That's your next proposal value, very simple. You take one of the uh, particles and you change its direction. Okay? That is, that, is, that is what that Q is. That is what that Q is. How, what can be more simpler than that, right? You take one of the particles and change it uh, uh, like uh, direction. That's it. That's it. And then you have this probability, right? The nice thing is you see this pi, which is the target density, which you do, you do your minus, you know, that function energy by kt that has z, but you don't know z, but you see that pi is in the numerator and the denominator that z cancels out. So it doesn't depend on the normalizing constant, normal constant. So you normalizing constant. So you can actually calculate it. Very simple. And then you flip a coin with that probability. If it says you move to that state or not. Very simple. You can all, we can all go, go back to our office and we can run it. All, all of us. All of us can do it. All of us can do it. And that's what they did. That's what they did in 1950s. That's what they did. They did this. They ran it for a long time. Using one of the first computers, actually, <laughs> one of the first computers they did, uh, and uh, uh, and in the long run, so so obviously you can see that the, when you are starting, that is not matching with the energy. Energy obviously it is not because you don't know which you know which state corresponds to this energy. But in the long run, it is. In the long run, it is going to. Be. So that's the Markov chain, and um, and that that's the method they use uh, to build the first form. Okay. okay. Now here's an, uh, so I have uh, ten minutes. Now we we'll give another example. This is uh, from plant science. So this is a problem that some of my, uh, you know, biologists public in my uh, university are working on. Uh, so there is uh, something called SAM, the soup apical meristem, which is a small pool of stem cells, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, like, you know, which controls many uh, traits of a plant, like, you know, the flowering time, how uh, the year length, uh, uh, and you know how sturdy the plant is going to be. There's a lot of things. You know, uh, I have an Iowa here, so he, you know he knows how big the corn industry in Iowa. Uh, so a lot of research in, in our university, uh, you know, uh, has to do with corn and soybean. Uh, so so this is from corn. 
Um, uh, so uh, this this data set is from the uh, Plant Science Institute. This uh, data set is generated at my university from uh, you know Plant Science Institute. So here is a picture again, uh, uh, you know, uh, originated from the Plant Science Institute. Um, so this is the SAM variation, basically three you know some different size of the SAM. And um, so as I said, uh, you know, different things are controlled by SAM. So you just can't understand. You know what? You know what? How we can? You know, uh, uh, predict how you know how the SAM size is going to be whether it be large or small. You know. So what uh, uh, genetists do? They do what is called the gen uh, genome wide association study, the GWAS. They try to find out which are the important seeds, which are the important markers. Uh, you know, uh, for a particular trait, like for a human. Uh, you know, this is for example, uh, you know, cardiomyopathy. Which are the genes controlling the cardiomyopathy, and you know the set of genes which was you know five ten years back. Now it's close to hundred. People are finding more genes right, in, for uh, cardiomyopathy, for example. So same thing here. They want to know which SNPs, which markers are important uh, for uh, uh, these um, uh, these uh, these traits, these these phenotypes. So uh, here is, uh, I mean, you know, here's the data set that was provided by, you know, that, that was originated again from the Plant Science Institute in our university. So they had, uh, you know, 369 uh, values from 369 maize inbred lines, so different process. And uh, so you can see that that's the number of responses I have. And I have uh, uh, one point information on like 1.2 million uh, SNPs, okay? So out of 1.2 million markers, uh, there are only a few, less than five markers which are important. So you have to find those important five markers from 1.2 million markers. So it's kind of finding needles in history, okay? In fact, uh, until a few years back, I was not convinced that this is going to be you know, this, we, can, we can do this, we can do this. Um, but again, for students, you can see how complex, you know, uh, how important the in, in interdisciplinary, uh, uh, you know, collaborations are, uh, because then you can. So you know, I, you know, I was so people were doing it. I was not convinced, and then until some of these biologists came to me and they said, well, you know, this is important for me. They said, okay, maybe I, I should. Yeah. So that's how I moved to, you know, high dimensional data analysis. Moved to me, and I, you know, I started working on high dimensional data analysis. Uh, so, so this is an important problem, and uh, and you know there is uh, you have like you know you need good mathematics training as well as you need to be good in computing to solve this kind of complex problems that are arising in science and engineering. So, um, you know even after deleting the duplicates uh, and you know uh, so, so MAF stands for minor allele frequency, even like deleting the you know the uh, SNP switches less than 5% MAF, minor allele frequency, still you have more than 800,000 uh, SNPs to choose from those important markers. So if you like, you know, if you're familiar with linear regression, right, where you have predictors and you have dependent variables, the response will be denoted by Y, the predictors by X, and the linear regression says Y equal to X beta, right? And then you feed that and you find beta, right? This is all the ordinary least square method, for example, the least square method you use, but those are only applicable when your number of predictors is less than number of observations. Here, your number of observations is 369. Your number of predictors is close to a million. Forget about ordinary least square. You cannot use it. Okay? So there are different techniques uh, people use it. So mainly what is known as the penalization methods. You have to have, so think about this. So your X matrix, so your A, Y is an n-dimensional vector, right? 369 dimensional vector. Your X matrix is a 369 times a close to a million dimensional matrix. If you're not good in computing, you cannot even save that in your computer. So you have to be, you know, to store it also, you have to, you know, you have to uh, like efficiently uh, use methods to store it. Forget about analyzing it. Okay. So I, I'm just trying to, you know, uh, help you understand 
the you know uh, the the current problems you have to you know you cannot ignore computing okay math is important computing is also important equally important okay equally important so there are different techniques as i said i am giving one solution which is known as uh, you know a bayesian uh, variable selection method so where basically what you do you again you work with that linear regression setup but then you introduce a set of indicator variables P is that, you know, 800,000 dimensional vector, uh, you know, uh, that gamma is a 800,000 uh, dimensional vector. Basically, each gamma it takes value 0 or 1, 0 or 1, 0 or 1, right? 0 means that SNP is not important, 1 means that is important. And you want to find out which are which gammas are 1 and which are zeros. And obviously, you can understand most of them are zeros. It's a sparse vector. Without sparsity, you cannot do anything here. Uh, so, only a very few are ones, but again, what are the possibilities? Every gamma is 0 or 1. It's a p dimensional vector, so the possibility is 2 to the power p, 2 to the power million. You know that 2 to the power 70 already, I have a number you exist. You know, 75 or 6. Now I'm talking about 2 to the power million. How do you find out those gamma? Okay, now there are different uh, solutions to that. Um, at the risk of self promotion, uh, this summer uh, I uh, released an R package called uh, GeoMC. There is a function called GeoMC.vs. Okay, R is free. You can just go to install R on your laptop and then install the package GeoMC. There's a function called GeoMC.vs, and you just need to. So that's what I did. So library GeoMC, I'm calling that function, and I just write this this one line. Okay, the x matrix. Okay, that x matrix that 369 by 800,000 dimensional matrix x. The y the response, and I'm get telling him how many samples you need. So suppose I give, I tell him that you know n dot determine how many iterations of the Markov chain you want to do. Hundred. So then it will give you. Hundred sample of a Markov chain, a Markov chain from that model with hundred samples, and then there are different summaries which tells you, for example, what is the gamma. Like we want to know which are the important predictors. It you know it gives you those values. Okay. Again, I said that the uh, risk of self promotion, but there is no other methods available right now which can handle these large numbers other than these factors. So possibly they justify them talking about my practice. Okay, that's it. Yes. Oh, so they asked me to hand over this mic. I don't know whether you want to use it. Okay. No, I can hear it. Do I have a The technical aspect of this uh, method, but uh, my neighboring lab seems to do this G bars and Christian analysis a lot. <laughs> Uh, even though you had like thousands of gram carbon or no matter how many number of gram carbon you had, like you had given example of maize, we had done on sugar cane and then wheat and all. But always we had found that no matter how much predictability you give accurately, when it comes to actually implementing in the plant breeding, mm -hmm. it always had more than 50% of the genetic value. I see. Those regions what we are trying to identify yes. the base of sometimes 50 kilograms, 100 kilograms. In that region, you are trying to identify those markers which are not even slightly more than separate, but which are like roughly like 50 kilograms apart, which is nearest the snake you are looking for a particular thing. And always having them in that but in that particular that particular change you are looking for. Always you have a very high genetic value. 
I see. I see. So that's what I thought it wondered me that either this uh, mark of fact that is able to take care of those kind of effect predictions or not. Uh, do you have any insights on that? Uh, well, I'm not a biologist, so I, you know, I, I, I can, I'm going to take your questions to my <laughs> biologist okay. colleagues. Um, but the thing is, so, uh, so there are different, uh, uh, you know, for, so the, okay, so let me go back to this uh, model. So there are different, um, uh, you know, uh, summaries that you can get from this model. So, so. Some, as you said, which will have good predictability power, you can use those to predict for the new uh, thing. Some will have good identical power, you know. So, so different summaries has different powers, and and um, possibly, as you said, you know, the R square just having good high R square may not be the thing that you know. And uh, obviously, there the scientific uh, you know insight has to be uh, uh, brought into that, and uh, and the thing is uh, you know um, uh, so what I can tell you that these methods we have used for different uh, you know data sets always come up with good models where you have good r square the predictive powers now if obviously if you are not like doing gwas i cannot tell you but if you're doing gwas the alternatives are which are like you know like for example like the the current state of the art they do gene by gene which does not take into account any joint you know effect the joint structure of the variables but on the other hand, these models that I'm talking about here, this get into that, you know, the joint structure of the SNPs, their dependence into the effect. Obviously, you know, then your uh, other question also comes into, you know, how many, how much effort you're going to do the sampling from. And so, yeah, so again, you know, I, I don't have all the solution. I don't have even answer to all your questions. I do not know. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. The, even the possibility is the same. In my term, the state space also gets higher, you know, exactly. because there are, yes, yeah, and the imputation and everything gets higher. You know, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any other question? Uh, hi. Uh, yes. So, uh, how important is this skew that holds the. Ah, very good. Very good. It's very important. It's very important. Very good questions. So your target is pi, right? As I said, you can use any Q, any Q. As uh, you know, in my Boltzmann distribution, I was just doing one, like I was just flipping one of the uh, particles, which has like which is which has no information about what the pi is. Now, thing is, theoretically, this chain will converge to pi, but it will take more time. Or any cube, any cube, any cube, any cube will work. Any cube, it's very little assumption. That's why I'm saying no assumption. Very assumption. For example, the state space has to be the same and stuff. Like that's you know, yeah, very mild assumption. But the thing is, if you have a cube which is using information about pi, which is closer to pi, then obviously you will converge quickly, right? So uh, they are has led to the research of developing efficient Markov chains, efficient MCMC algorithms. So I was talking about this GMC VS that R package that is based on basically that R package is implementing a brand new class of MCMC algorithms 
which uses information about pi, uh, all the all the different informations about pi that it can have. So so yeah. So uh, you know more uh, uh, if q is closer to pi, that Markov that will result in a better Markov chain, better in some algorithm which will converse you know quicker. Is there any other question? Okay. Yeah, there's one question back there. The sampling, uh, the sampling, uh, you have to choose each sample by running the mark of chain, isn't it? Once. So we get one sample by running the mark of chain once, isn't it? Okay, so very good question. Uh, the thing is, see, remember, my solution is this uh, sample me, right? That's so remember, my goal is this, this uh, sum, right? This mean, population mean. This is uh, average over n samples, okay? So basically, this is, suppose you run the Markov chain. I'm, I'm assuming that you are talking about in the Markov chain context, right? So if you run the Markov chain for, say, 100 iterations, like just I, I was showing you in the, my last slide, n dot iter is 100, 100 iterations, then you use all these 100 values all these 100 numbers, all these 100 samples in this average. Now, so that is what is being done in the uh, Monte Carlo estimator. The thing is that the, the, this x i is, is converts to pi, the distribution, it will never be pi. So you won't, there is no x, no matter how many iterations you run, you will get an exact sample from pi. You will never get an exact sample of pi. You will never. But you don't need it. This log large number says, for log large number for Markov chain says, you know, uh, as long as pi is the stationary distribution, this average is converge. You don't need an exact sample. But you have to let go some, right? For the burning, for the MCLC, for the initially, the old. Well, the theoreticians end. don't believe in burning. That's only, um, well, so we can talk about it. So you don't need any burning. You can use any. You can use samples from the starting one, but obviously the final sample performance will be different. Uh, if you if you use an appropriate burning, then uh, if you like, you know. But this you don't need. You can start from. Yeah, but in CMC, like your samples are not independent. It will never be independent. It will not be a, never be independent. It will never be exact. You still don't need burning. Theoretically, you don't need burning, but why use use burning? You know, that's for some final sample performance. That's the main thing. But it is still a law, you know, the law of large number still holds, no matter where. The law of large number doesn't depend on burning. Yeah. Just yeah. A, the brief historical question. Mm -hmm. So uh, during this uh, kind of uh, invention or development of nuclear bomb, mm -hmm. so and when we need to, when they need to sub, uh, kind of sample from the whole the distribution, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they must have not having that kind of computing facility. Right, that's right. They build their first computer there. Yeah. That's okay, unfortunately. <laughs> so the yeah. computer was actually invented. The yeah, so they, they, capacity yeah, they, they, yes, yes, a lot of things happen. But they knew the kind of, uh, maybe they are kind of one women actually developing this, but they also knew the use of computer later at some time. So, is it only for the nuclear bomb that that might have some computation was needed? That's why the computer was kind of developed, or there are other, yeah, you know, I, I think there are other, but the other problems were also, I know, related to statistical mechanics. So, for example, the ABC, the, 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 the computer ABC, that was also from the physics lab. And so, you know, again, some problems with, uh, you know, I think uh, from physics, you know. Yeah. 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 Is there any other question? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah. The GOMC package. Yeah, the GOMC package. So is it uh, handling for bigger uh, size or uh, uh, better efficiency like accuracy or? Uh, no, very good. Uh, so I, yeah, sorry, I only talk about this function uh, GOMC.vs, which is only for this variable selection stuff. Right. But there is a function called GOMC where you can give any target distribution. You just have to write down the log of the target and, and you know, after normalizing constant, discrete or continuous. 
you give you samples. Now, when you say that what it is implementing, like, so it's implementing a Markov chain. It's a new Markov chain. So, you know, there is a question about what type of queue is better, right? So it is using a type of queue, which is using information about pi, okay? If you want to tell me in details, I will be very happy to tell you in details, but I think I, we can avoid that right now. So, so, but if you're, if you're, for example, if you're familiar with random work, then I can tell you, so what random work does, it makes a move in the Euclidean space. But we know the distributions live on a, the, you know, the, the probability distributions has a manifold structure, has a Riemannian manifold structure. So the GeoMC, that's a name called Geo, from geometry. So it makes a move in a manifold in the direction of pi. So that's why it moves much faster than, than the random. So that's, that's, that's Oh, okay, so it's been improved then on that, right? Yeah, 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 it's been improved, yes, yes. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, I might come as a, a layman. Oh, no, 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 all of you are all of layman. Yeah. I am from heritage management. Okay, and... I, I, you know, I went to a building in the morning. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's good. All right, so uh, my question is, as you said, uh, you take variables from a random sample, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, you use uh, like the you keep on uh, like you know reusing them, and uh, then a chain comes. Right. Mm -hmm. There are there are several numbers that you can come up with. So what I'm concerned here is uh, there can be a possibility where more variables can be found, or what known to us is limited. Right. Am I am I being too vague with this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying how it was seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you repeat that? Uh, so, like the variables that you use there. Uh, Did I? You, you, can, you, can you tell me the slide? Yeah. So, should I go back? Uh, yes. Uh, like maybe. I guess I understand what he's trying to say. Okay, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, basically, what he's saying is. Um, uh, in your K, the number of variables, what if you have more and more variables? Yes. So, like, if the possibility of that uh, end of going up and down, right? Uh, you mean the sample size? You mean the sample size? Yes. Oh, yeah. How many samples? No, no, no. The sample up and down? Yes. So, oh. like, you know, here we know that there is only up and down, but what if there are, like, more? Like, ah, like, that's, so yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Yeah. So, as I said, this is the, uh, the simplest possible model. And that's where I, I was trying to show you. So I think not only really simple, but it's still used a lot. But there itself, you see the problem. Now, in general, it's not so simple. It can go in different directions. Not only that, the neighbors can interact with each other. You know, you were, we were I know a lot of you were, you know, you were trying to study environment, climates here. So there is a model called autologistic model. So it, which are used to field binary, you know, model binary, uh, you know, spatial data. It's a very popular model. The same thing. So, but there, you see. So basically, you know, you think about the, you know, so urban, uh, say, vegetation map in urban, right? Whether you have this, like, you know, vegetation here, it depends on the neighbors and stuff like that. It depends on the neighbors. So that's the spatial structure. Now you see, it is dependent on other. So again, you can have this, think about the simple thing, whether there is vegetation or no vegetation, up or down, or yes or no, one or zero, only two possibilities, but they depend on the neighbors. So it's much more complicated now. So yes, you were right. So I was trying, I just trying to give you the simplest possibilities. So there itself, it is so complex, just out of, you know, like, as, like you know, you don't have to get, have 80, what is this? More complex, yeah. The sum is even more complicated. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, I couldn't get your question, no, no, yes. but yeah, yes. Starting. In the starting, you were talking about the assignment problem. Uh -huh. So we assume that two two assignments are not affecting each other. Uh -huh. So I just. Uh, want that you uh, can you give please a brief, uh, brief explanation of what if 
performance in one assignment would affect the no. performance of second assignment. How would that graph distribution of x plus y would change? Uh, that would change. I cannot even tell you how it would change. Depends on how they are correlated. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you can see. So for example, if you have uh, if you have information that if you are taking longer on one, the other will be much shorter. Then the, that graph will be very different from if you know that if you are taking long here, it will come, take long there. The graph will change yeah. quite differently, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the dependent structure. So then if there you need more information about how dependent they are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So that's why I made the simple assumption that they're not dependent. But if you're dependent, the you know the structure will be very yeah. Nice. Yeah, it depends on the dependent structure. Yes. Which I think we will monitor the discussion outside. Okay. So let's head towards figure. Effect in each other. Uh -huh. So I just uh, want that you uh, can you give please br a brief explanation of what if performance in one assignment would affect the no. performance of second assignment. How would that graph distribution of x plus y would change? Uh, that would change. I cannot even tell you how it would change. Depends on how they are correlated. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you can see, so for example, if you have, uh, if you have information that if you are taking longer on one, the other will be much shorter, then the, that graph will be very different from if you know that if you are taking long here, it will come, take long there. The graph will change yeah. quite differently, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the dependent structure. So then if there you need more information about how dependent they are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So that's why I made the simple assumption that they're not dependent. But if you're dependent, the you know the structure will be very yeah. Yeah, it yeah, depends on the dependent structure. Yes. Which I think we will monitor the discussion outside. Okay. So let's head towards figure.